Welcome to History Uncovered, where we delve into the stories and events that have shaped our world. If you're a fan of history, be sure to hit that subscribe button below. We release new videos every day so you'll always have something new to discover. By subscribing, you'll be the first to know when our latest episodes are released, and you'll be supporting us in our mission to bring fascinating stories from the past to a wider audience. In this episode, we journey back to the zenith of the ancient Roman Empire, to the grandeur and splendor of an empire that spanned three continents. We will be exploring the life and reign of one of its most visionary rulers, a figure whose legacy is still visible in the architectural wonders and boundaries of today Emperor Hadrian. Hadrian, a name that resonates with the spirit of exploration, innovation, and unity. An emperor who not only fortified the vast stretches of the empire, but also championed the arts, culture, and philosophy. His reign, marked by the construction of the iconic Hadrian's Wall, extensive travels across the empire, and a profound passion for Hellenistic culture, has left an indelible mark on the tapestry of history. From the bustling streets of Rome to the distant reaches of Britannia, from the sun-kissed lands of Egypt to the ancient cities of Greece, we will trace the footsteps of this multifaceted emperor. We'll peel back the layers of time to reveal the man behind the imperial title. A man of peace and war, of art and strategy, of love and loss. So, prepare yourself as we embark on this captivating journey into the life of Hadrian, the Traveler Emperor, a man whose vision reshaped the Roman world and whose influence echoes to this very day. In the ancient Roman town of Italica, near present-day Seville, a future emperor was born on January 24th, 76 AD this town, established during the Second Punic War by Scipio Africanus, would be the starting point for Hadrian's remarkable journey. Though some argue he was born in Rome, the majority believe his roots lie in Italica. His family, the Gens Elia, traced their origins to Hadria in Italia, which inspired Hadrian's name. His father, Publius Elius Hadrianus Afer, was a senator of Praetorian rank, deeply rooted in Italica. His mother, Domitia Paulina, came from the esteemed senatorial family of Gades, now Cadiz. Growing up, Hadrian had the company of an elder sister, Elia Domitia Paulina. A touching aspect of his early life was his bond with his wet nurse, Germana, a slave likely of Germanic origin. Their bond was so profound that he later granted her freedom, and she even outlived him, as a funerary inscription in Hadrian's villa in Tivoli attests. Family ties played a crucial role in shaping Hadrian's destiny. His great-nephew, Nius Pedanius Fusca Salinator from Barcino, would later become his co-consul. But it was his relationship with Trajan, his father's first cousin, that would be pivotal. Both born and raised in Italica, they were often perceived as outsiders in the heart of Rome. At just ten years old, Hadrian faced the heartbreak of losing both his parents. He and his sister were then placed under the guardianship of Trajan and Publius Acilius Adianus. Young Hadrian was more than just a scholar, he was active and loved hunting. Recognizing his potential, Trajan called him to Rome at fourteen, ensuring he received an education worthy of an aristocrat. His love for Greek culture earned him a playful nickname, Greculus, hinting at his deep appreciation for Hellenistic traditions. Hadrian's journey through the intricate web of Roman politics and military began humbly as a member of the Decemvirist Litibus Judicandes. This was a stepping stone in the Cursus Honorum, the ladder of Roman political advancement. From there, he transitioned into the role of a military tribune, serving with Legio II Adiatrix and then Legio V Macedonica. During his time with the latter, Emperor Nerva chose Trajan as his successor. Hadrian, possibly among other emissaries, was tasked with delivering this news to Trajan. His military journey continued with a transfer to Legio XII Primogenia. These three tribunates gave Hadrian an edge in his career, as most from established senatorial families only served one or two. Upon Nerva's death in 98, Hadrian raced to Trajan, reaching him even before the official envoy, Lucius Julius Ursus Servianus, his brother-in-law and rival. By 101, Hadrian was back in Rome, taking on the role of Quester and then Quester Imperatoris Triani, acting as a bridge between the Emperor and the Senate. He possibly even penned the Emperor's speeches and communiques. 
Following this, he kept the Senate's records as a Actus Senatus. Hadrian's military and political journey intertwined. During the First Dacian War, he was part of Trajan's entourage, later taking office in Rome. After the war, he likely became praetor. In the Second Dacian War, he was once again by Trajan's side, later taking command of Legio I Minervia and then governing Lower Pannonia. Here, he faced the challenge of the Sarmatians and successfully repelled an invasion by the Iazyges. The peace terms remain a mystery, but it's believed the Romans retained Altenia, possibly in exchange for a tribute, while the Iazyges took Bana. In his mid-thirties, Hadrian's journey took him to Greece. The Athenians granted him citizenship and even made him their eponymous archon for a short period in 112. They honored him with a statue detailing his achievements. His time in Greece was followed by joining Trajan's campaign against Parthia. Later, he was appointed as the governor of Syria, effectively becoming the commander of the Eastern Roman army. As Trajan's health deteriorated, he set course for Rome, leaving Hadrian in Syria. Trajan's journey ended in Salinas, Cilicia, where he passed away on August 8th. His legacy as one of Rome's most revered emperors was cemented, and Hadrian's own legacy was just beginning. In the early years of the 2nd century, around 100 or 101 AD, Hadrian's life took a significant turn. He married Vibia Sabina, Trajan's young grandniece who was around 17 or 18 at the time. The union, however, was far from idyllic. Trajan himself appeared to have reservations about the match, and the couple's relationship would later be marred by scandals. Some speculate that the marriage was orchestrated by Trajan's empress, Plotina. A woman of culture and influence, Plotina shared many of Hadrian's ideals, particularly the vision of the Roman Empire as a Hellenic commonwealth. If Hadrian were to succeed Trajan, Plotina and her family would maintain their political sway. Hadrian also found an ally in his mother-in-law, Salonia Matidia. She was the daughter of Trajan's cherished sister, Ulpia Marciana. When Ulpia passed away in 112, Trajan deified her and bestowed upon Salonia the title of Augusta. Yet, Hadrian's relationship with Trajan was intricate and possibly strained. There are hints that Hadrian tried to influence Trajan through the emperor's young favorites, leading to some undisclosed disputes around the time of his marriage to Sabina. Despite being under Trajan's patronage, Hadrian's rise wasn't meteoric. Late in Trajan's reign, Hadrian only managed to secure a suffect consulship for 108, granting him a status on par with the senatorial elite but not the distinct honor of an heir apparent. Trajan could have elevated Hadrian to the patrician rank, fast-tracking his path to consulship, but he refrained. Interestingly, Hadrian was granted the office of tribune of the plebs slightly earlier than usual, but this came with a catch. He had to leave Dacia and Trajan, suggesting that Trajan might have wanted some distance from him. The Historia Augusta recounts a symbolic gesture, Trajan's gift of a diamond ring to Hadrian, the same ring Trajan had received from Nerva. This act seemed to bolster Hadrian's aspirations for the throne. However, while Trajan did champion Hadrian's rise, he did so with a discernible degree of caution. The transition of power in ancient Rome was a delicate matter. Without a clear heir, the empire risked descending into chaos, with multiple contenders vying for the throne, potentially leading to civil war. On the other hand, nominating an heir too early could be perceived as an abdication, jeopardizing a smooth transition. As Trajan's health deteriorated, the question of succession became pressing. While on his deathbed, surrounded by his wife, Plotina, and the watchful eyes of Prefect Adianus, Trajan had the legal right to name Hadrian as his heir through a simple deathbed declaration before witnesses. However, when the adoption document emerged, it bore not Trajan's signature, but Plotina's, and was dated a day after Trajan's demise. Adding to the irregularities, Hadrian was in Syria at the time, and Roman adoption laws mandated both parties to be present during the adoption ceremony. Whispers and speculations surrounded Hadrian's adoption and subsequent ascension. Some even suggest that Phetimus, Trajan's young servant who died shortly after the emperor, might have been silenced or took his own life to avoid uncomfortable interrogations. Ancient sources are split on the matter. 
Dio Cassius viewed the adoption as fraudulent, while the Historia Augusta deemed it legitimate. An Aureus, a gold coin minted early in Hadrian's reign, offers a glimpse into the official stance, portraying Hadrian as Trajan Caesar, indicating his position as the chosen heir. Hadrian's accession to the throne was not without its complexities. As per the Historia Augusta, he wrote to the Senate, presenting his ascension as a done deal. He justified the swift endorsement by the troops, emphasizing the necessity of having an emperor at the helm. In gratitude for their loyalty, he rewarded the legions with the traditional bonus. The Senate, in turn, ratified his acclamation. Public ceremonies were orchestrated, celebrating Hadrian's divine election by the gods, a pantheon that now included the deified Trajan, added at Hadrian's behest. However, Hadrian's initial days as emperor were not solely ceremonial. He stayed in the east, suppressing the Jewish revolt that had ignited during Trajan's reign. He replaced Judea's governor, the renowned Moorish general Lucius Quietus, and then proceeded to address disturbances along the Danube frontier. Back in Rome, a conspiracy was allegedly unearthed by Hadrian's former guardian and then Praetorian prefect, Adianus. The purported plot involved Lucius Quietus and three eminent senators. Instead of a public trial, they were tried in absentia and subsequently executed. Hadrian distanced himself from these actions, attributing them to Adianus's independent decisions. He then elevated Adianus to senatorial status and consular rank, only to retire him by 120. In a move to placate the Senate, Hadrian vowed to uphold their age-old right to judge their own. The true motivations behind the executions remain shrouded in mystery. It's possible that the official acknowledgement of Hadrian as the rightful heir came too belatedly, leaving room for other contenders. These executed senators were among Trajan's inner circle and could have been potential rivals for the throne. They might have also been proponents of Trajan's expansionist agenda, which Hadrian aimed to alter. Among them was Aulus Cornelius Palma, who had vested interests in the East. The Historia Augusta suggests that two of the senators had publicly voiced their animosity towards Hadrian. Another, Gaius Avidius Nigrinus, was a prominent senator and likely Hadrian's primary competitor for the throne. There are even claims that Hadrian had once contemplated naming Nigrinus as his successor before deciding to eliminate him. By 125, Hadrian appointed Quintus Martius Turbo, a close ally and distinguished member of the equestrian order, as his praetorian prefect. Hadrian also implemented legal reforms, ensuring the Senate's authority over its members and maintaining its position as the supreme appellate court. Despite these efforts, the rift between Hadrian and the Senate deepened, casting a shadow over his reign. Some sources even hint at Hadrian employing a covert network of informers, the frumentarii, to discreetly probe into the affairs of high-ranking individuals, including senators and his personal acquaintances. Hadrian's reign marked a distinct shift in the way the Roman Empire was governed. Unlike his predecessors, who largely depended on reports from their representatives scattered across the empire, Hadrian believed in first-hand experience. He embarked on extensive travels, spending over half his reign outside Italy. While previous emperors did leave Rome, it was typically for warfare, returning once peace was restored. Hadrian's continuous journeys, however, had a different purpose. His travels can be seen as a deliberate departure from the traditional Roman view of the empire as a domain dominated solely by Rome. Instead, Hadrian envisioned a more inclusive empire, a commonwealth of diverse yet civilized communities bound together by a shared Hellenic culture, all under Roman oversight. He championed the establishment of provincial towns or municipia, which were semi-independent urban centers with their unique customs and laws. This was in contrast to the earlier practice of setting up new Roman colonies that strictly adhered to Roman ways. Hadrian's cosmopolitan vision is evident in the coinage from his later years, depicting the emperor uplifting various provincial personifications. Elias Aristides, a later orator, would describe Hadrian as extending a protecting hand to his subjects, aiding them as one would help someone rise from a fall. However, this inclusive approach was not universally appreciated. Roman traditionalists viewed it with skepticism. 
Nero, a previous emperor, had indulged in a lengthy and peaceful sojourn in Greece, drawing criticism from the Roman elite for neglecting his imperial duties. Yet, in the eastern provinces and even parts of the west, Nero was popular. Rumors of his return or rebirth surfaced soon after his demise. Hadrian might have tapped into this positive sentiment during his own travels, drawing parallels with Nero's popularity. The Historia Augusta even goes so far as to label Hadrian as a little too much Greek, suggesting he was too worldly for a Roman emperor's role. Hadrian's tenure as emperor was marked by his hands-on approach, and this was evident in his dealings with Britannia. Before his arrival, the province had been embroiled in a significant rebellion from 119 to 121. This unrest led to significant troop movements, with inscriptions referencing an Expeditio Britannica, which involved the deployment of a detachment of around 3,000 soldiers. The historian Fronto even mentioned military losses in Britannia during this period. By 119 to 120, Quintus Pompeius Falco was dispatched to restore order. In 122, Hadrian took a monumental step. He began the construction of a wall, famously known today as Hadrian's Wall, with the intent of separating Romans from barbarians. While it's tempting to think that the wall was a direct response to a tangible threat, the actual reasons might be more nuanced. It's possible that Hadrian wanted to halt the expansion of the empire. The wall could also have been a cost-effective defense strategy, serving not just as a deterrent to invasions, but also as a means to regulate trade and immigration. During this period, Britannia was personified and venerated, a shrine was built in her honor in York, and coins bearing her image were minted. By the end of 122, Hadrian left Britannia, never to see the completed wall that would carry his name for millennia. His journey continued through southern Gaul. In the Mausus, he possibly oversaw the construction of a basilica in honor of his patroness, Plotina, who had recently passed away and was deified at his behest. Around this time, Hadrian made significant administrative changes. He dismissed his secretary, the famed biographer Suetonius, for alleged excessive familiarity with the empress. Similarly, Gaius Septicius Clarus, the Praetorian prefect, was removed from his position, possibly under the same pretext. Hadrian then wintered in 122-123 at Taraco in Spain, where he undertook the restoration of the Temple of Augustus. In 123 AD, Hadrian's attention shifted from the western fringes of the empire to its eastern territories. He sailed across the Mediterranean to Mauritania, where he didn't just oversee, but personally spearheaded a campaign against local uprisings. However, his stay in Mauritania was brief. News reached him of potential war preparations by the Parthian Empire, a recurrent adversary of Rome. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, Hadrian promptly moved eastward. During his travels, he made a stop at Cyrene. This city had previously suffered during the Jewish revolt under Trajan, leading to the destruction of several public structures. In 119 AD, early in his reign, Hadrian had sponsored the restoration of these buildings, showcasing his commitment to the province's welfare. Now, during his visit, he took his patronage a step further. He personally financed the military training of young men from Cyrene's elite families, ensuring that they were well prepared to serve in the Roman legions. Such acts of personal investment in the provinces were, as Burley notes, very much characteristic of Hadrian. Upon reaching the Euphrates, Hadrian took a hands-on approach, personally brokering a settlement with the Parthian king Osrozai. After inspecting the Roman defenses in the region, he journeyed westward, skirting the Black Sea coast. It's likely that he spent the winter in Nicomedia, the principal city of Bithynia. This city had recently suffered a devastating earthquake, and Hadrian, true to his character, provided funds for its reconstruction. As a result, he was hailed as the restorer of the province. During this period, it's speculated that Hadrian might have visited Claudiopolis, where he possibly encountered Antonus, a strikingly handsome young man who would later become his lover. The specifics of their first meeting remain shrouded in mystery. While some sources suggest they met when Antonus was around 20, in 123, he would have been a mere adolescent, around 13 or 14 years old. 
Another theory posits that Antonus was sent to Rome for training as a page in the emperor's service and gradually ascended to the position of Hadrian's favorite. The intricacies of their relationship, however, remain largely undocumented. Continuing his journey, with or without Antonus, Hadrian traversed Anatolia. Local traditions hint at his presence in various locations, and one such legend credits him with founding a city named Hadrianuthery in Mysia, following a triumphant boar hunt. Around this time, the long-standing project to complete the Temple of Zeus in Cyzicus, initiated by the Pergamon kings, was set into motion. This temple was graced with a massive statue of Hadrian. Furthermore, several cities, including Cyzicus, Pergamon, Smyrna, Ephesus, and Sards, were elevated as regional hubs for the imperial cult known as Neocoros. In the autumn of 124, Hadrian set foot in Greece, immersing himself in the Eleusinian mysteries. His bond with Athens was special, having been previously honored with citizenship and an archonate by the city. Responding to the Athenians' request, he even revised their constitution, introducing a new phyle named after him. Hadrian's approach to governance was a blend of active intervention and judicious restraint. For instance, he refrained from meddling in a local dispute between olive oil producers and the Athenian assembly over production quotas. Yet, he generously granted an imperial subsidy to ensure Athens' grain supply. Recognizing the importance of public games, festivals, and competitions, Hadrian established two foundations to fund these events in the absence of local sponsors. He encouraged Greek notables to prioritize essential infrastructure projects, such as aqueducts and public fountains. Athens, for instance, received a sophisticated water system from Mount Parnes, while Thirsty Argos was blessed with several nymphia to address its chronic water scarcity. During the winter, Hadrian embarked on a tour of the Peloponnese. His journey, though its exact path remains uncertain, included a visit to Epidaurus, where he was honored with a statue for his restorative efforts. It's speculated that during this time, Antonus, a young man from Bithynia, had become Hadrian's lover. This relationship might explain Hadrian's special attention to Mantinia, which had ties to Antonus' homeland. Hadrian's generosity extended to restoring various ancient shrines across the region, including those in Abae, Megara, and the Hiraean of Argos. A significant political move during this tour was Hadrian's persuasion of the Spartan leader, Eurycles Herculanus, and the Athenian noble, Herod's Atticus the Elder, to join the Roman Senate. This marked the first time representatives from Old Greece entered the Senate, symbolizing the integration of traditional Greek powers into Roman political life. In March 125, Hadrian took center stage at the Athenian festival of Dionysia, donning traditional Athenian attire. He also undertook the monumental task of completing the Temple of Olympian Zeus, a project that had been in the works for over five centuries, showcasing his commitment to merging Roman and Greek cultures. After his extensive travels in Greece, Hadrian journeyed back to Italy, making a pit stop in Sicily. His contributions to the island's restoration were commemorated on coins, cementing his legacy as its rejuvenator. Once back in Rome, he marveled at the newly reconstructed Pantheon and took pleasure in the completion of his villa in Tiber, nestled amidst the picturesque Sabine Hills. In March 127, the Everestless Hadrian embarked on an Italian tour. His path can be pieced together from records of his generous donations and gifts. Among his notable contributions, he refurbished the shrine of Cuper in Cuper Maritima and enhanced the drainage system of the Fusine Lake. However, not all his decisions were met with approval. His move to split Italy into four regions, each overseen by an imperial legate with consular rank, was a contentious one. This essentially relegated Italy, excluding Rome, to a status akin to other provinces, shifting Italian legal cases away from Rome's courts. This decision was not well received by the Roman Senate, and the arrangement was short-lived, not extending much beyond Hadrian's reign. Around this period, Hadrian's health took a downturn. Despite the challenges posed by his ailment, the indefatigable emperor embarked on a trip to Africa in the spring of 128. His arrival was seen as fortuitous, coinciding with rains that ended a prolonged drought. In addition to playing the roles of benefactor and restorer, Hadrian took the time to review the troops, and a record of his address to them still exists. 
By summer, Hadrian was back in Italy, but not for long. He soon embarked on another expansive tour, one that would span three years. In the autumn of 128, Hadrian once again graced the Eleusinian mysteries with his presence. His focus during this visit seemed to be primarily on Athens and Sparta, the two ancient powerhouses of Greece. While he had previously toyed with the idea of centering his Greek revival around the Amphictyonic League in Delphi, Hadrian's ambitions had grown. He envisioned the Panhellenian, a grand council that would unify Greek cities. With the wheels set in motion for this grand assembly, determining which cities could genuinely claim Greek heritage would be a task for the future. From Greece, Hadrian journeyed through Asia, eventually reaching Egypt, likely escorted across the Aegean Sea by an Ephesian merchant named Lucius Erastus. In gratitude, Hadrian later penned a letter to the Council of Ephesus, endorsing Erastus for a position on the town council and even offering to cover the associated costs. Upon reaching Egypt, Hadrian began his stay by restoring the tomb of Pompey the Great in Pelusium, paying homage to the man credited with establishing Rome's eastern dominance. This act was likely a symbolic gesture, reaffirming Roman authority in the east after the disturbances during Trajan's reign. Hadrian's time in Egypt was marked by personal adventures as well, including a lion hunt in the Libyan desert with Antinous, as immortalized in a poem by the Greek poet Pancrates. However, a shadow was cast over Hadrian's Egyptian sojourn when Antinous, his beloved companion, tragically drowned in the Nile. The circumstances of his death remain shrouded in mystery, with theories ranging from accident and suicide to murder and even religious sacrifice. The Historia Augusta paints a vivid picture of Hadrian's grief, likening it to the mourning of a woman. In the aftermath, at Hadrian's behest, the Greeks deified Antinous, attributing oracles to him, though skeptics believed these to be the creations of Hadrian himself. In memory of Antinous, Hadrian founded the city of Antinoopolis on October 30, 130. Continuing his journey, he ventured to Thebes, where he visited the Colossi of Memnon. This visit was immortalized by four epigrams penned by Julia Balbilla. Following this, Hadrian journeyed northward, reaching the Fayum by December's onset. After his extensive travels down the Nile, the specifics of Hadrian's subsequent movements remained somewhat ambiguous. Whether he made his way back to Rome or not, it's evident that he spent the years 130 to 131 in the east, meticulously organizing and inaugurating his ambitious Panhellenian project, centered around the Athenian temple to Olympian Zeus. The initial idea of a Hellenic association based in Delphi had fallen through due to local disputes. In its place, Hadrian envisioned a grand alliance of all Greek cities. To be considered for membership in this league, cities had to present claims, whether genuine or fabricated, of Greek origins. Moreover, they had to demonstrate their loyalty to the Roman Empire, aligning with Hadrian's romanticized view of Hellenism. In this role, Hadrian cast himself as the guardian of Greek culture and its liberties, essentially, the concept of urban self-governance. This allowed him to position himself as the symbolic successor to Pericles, who, according to Plutarch's biography, had convened a similar Panhellenic Congress, even though this Congress is only mentioned by Plutarch. Interestingly, the allure of joining the Panhellenians seemed to be lost on the affluent, Hellenized cities of Asia Minor. They appeared to harbor resentment towards the prominence given to Athens and European Greece in Hadrian's vision. His interpretation of Hellenism was notably restrictive, emphasizing classical origins over the broader Hellenistic culture. However, certain cities with questionable Greek credentials, like Side, were fully recognized as Hellenic. George Simmel, the German sociologist, noted that the Panhellenian was rooted in games, commemorations, preservation of an ideal, and entirely non-political Hellenism. During his travels, Hadrian conferred honorific titles upon several regional hubs. Palmyra, for instance, was graced with a visit from the emperor and subsequently renamed Hadriana Palmyra. Hadrian also honored various influential figures from Palmyra, including Sotos, who had played a pivotal role in safeguarding Palmyrene trade between the Roman Empire and Parthia. The winter of 131 to 132 saw Hadrian in Athens, where he inaugurated the now-finished Temple of Olympian Zeus. 
By 132, he shifted his focus eastward, setting his sights on Dudia. Hadrian's handling of the situation in Dudia is a testament to the complexities of Roman provincial governance and the challenges of integrating diverse cultures into the Roman Empire. The Bar Kokhba Revolt, as it came to be known, was the third and final major rebellion by the Jews against the Roman Empire, and it resulted in devastating consequences for the Jewish population of the region. Hadrian's initial intentions for Jerusalem might have been benign from a Roman perspective. He possibly envisioned the city's reconstruction as a Roman colony, integrating it more fully into the Roman world. However, the potential assimilation of the Jewish temple into the Roman civic religious framework was a significant point of contention. While such assimilations had been successful in other provinces, the strict monotheism of Judaism proved resistant to these changes. The revolt, led by Simon Bar Kokhba, was a massive uprising against Roman rule. The reasons for the revolt are multifaceted. The Historia Augusta suggests that Hadrian's supposed ban on circumcision played a role, but this claim is debated among scholars. Other factors, such as Roman administrative policies, land disputes, and messianic prophecies, also likely contributed. The revolt was not a minor skirmish, but a major conflict that required significant Roman military intervention. Hadrian had to summon reinforcements from as far away as Britain and the Danube. The war was brutal, with significant casualties on both sides. The aftermath of the revolt was equally severe. Hadrian took punitive measures, renaming the province Syria Palestina and rebuilding Jerusalem as a Roman city, Ilia Capitolina. This act was not just a matter of urban planning, but a symbolic erasure of the city's Jewish identity. Hadrian's actions in Dudea highlight the challenges the Roman Empire faced in governing its vast territories, each with its unique cultures and traditions. While the empire was often adept at integrating diverse peoples, there were moments, as with the Bar Kokhba revolt, where cultural and religious tensions erupted into open conflict. Hadrian's response, a combination of military might and symbolic erasure, underscores the lengths to which the empire would go to maintain control and order. Hadrian's later years were marked by a sense of legacy and succession. The emperor, who had traveled extensively and worked to foster a sense of unity and culture throughout the empire, faced the challenge of ensuring a smooth transition of power. This was a significant concern for Roman emperors, as a lack of clear succession could lead to political instability or civil war. In 136, Hadrian adopted Lucius Sionius Commodus, who took the name Lucius Elius Caesar. This adoption was a political move, ensuring that Hadrian had a successor who could continue his policies and maintain stability in the empire. However, Elias was not to be Hadrian's successor for long. He died suddenly in 138, leading Hadrian to adopt Antoninus Pius on the condition that Antoninus would, in turn, adopt Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus as his successors. This chain of adoptions ensured a line of succession for the empire, a testament to Hadrian's forward-thinking approach to governance. However, Hadrian's final years were not without controversy. His relationship with the Senate had deteriorated, and his decision to execute four senators on charges of conspiracy damaged his reputation. The Senate was reluctant to deify Hadrian after his death, a significant honor for Roman emperors. It was only after Antoninus Pius's insistence and his agreement to deify Sabina that the Senate agreed to grant Hadrian divine status. Hadrian died in 138, leaving behind a complex legacy. He was a builder, a traveler, and a patron of the arts. He sought to unify the empire through culture and infrastructure, and his wall in Britannia stands as a testament to his efforts to solidify the empire's borders. However, his reign was also marked by conflict and controversy, particularly in his relationships with the Senate and the Jewish population in Judea. Like many emperors, Hadrian's legacy is multifaceted, reflecting the challenges and complexities of ruling one of history's most powerful empires. Hadrian's final years were indeed tumultuous and marked by political intrigue, personal vendettas, and a series of unfortunate events regarding his chosen successors. 
the deaths of his initial heir, Lucius Elius Caesar, and later the suspected conspiracy involving his brother-in-law, Lucius Julius Ursus Servianus, and Servianus's grandson, Gnius Pedanius Fuscus Salinator, added to the emperor's distress. The political landscape of Rome during Hadrian's reign was complex. The Senate, which had traditionally held significant power in the Roman Republic, had seen its influence wane under the autocratic rule of the emperors. Hadrian's relationship with the Senate was particularly strained, and this tension was exacerbated by his decisions regarding succession. The Senate's traditionalist members were likely wary of Hadrian's choices, especially given the unconventional paths he took in selecting his heirs. Hadrian's decision to adopt Elias Caesar was met with skepticism, as Elias did not have a strong military or political background, which was typically expected of a Roman emperor. His sudden death further complicated matters and forced Hadrian to once again address the issue of succession. The subsequent adoption of Antoninus Pius, with the stipulation that he, in turn, adopt both Lucius Sionius Commodus and Marcus Annius Verus, was a strategic move. It ensured a line of succession that would hopefully provide stability to the empire. However, the political maneuverings and the conditions of these adoptions might have been seen as Hadrian trying to exert control even beyond his death, which could have caused resentment among the Roman elites. The alleged conspiracy involving Servianus and his grandson Fuscus Salinator, whether real or a product of paranoia, resulted in their executions, further darkening the atmosphere of Hadrian's final days. The claim that Servianus cursed Hadrian before his death, wishing him a prolonged and painful end, paints a grim picture of the emperor's final moments. Hadrian's reign, while marked by significant achievements in architecture, culture, and administrative reforms, was also characterized by these personal and political challenges. His final years, filled with illness, political intrigue, and the weight of ensuring the empire's future stability were undoubtedly challenging and left a complex legacy for historians to interpret. Hadrian's death marked the end of a reign that was characterized by both significant achievements and controversies. His passion for architecture, art, and Hellenistic culture led to the construction of many iconic structures, including the Pantheon in its current form and the wall across northern Britain that bears his name, Hadrian's Wall. He also traveled extensively, more so than any of his predecessors, reinforcing the power and presence of Rome throughout the empire. However, his reign was not without its challenges. His relationship with the Senate was strained, and his decisions, especially those regarding succession, were often met with skepticism and resistance. The Senate's reluctance to deify him after his death underscores the tensions that existed between the emperor and the traditional Roman elite. Yet, Despite the Senate's initial hesitancy, Hadrian was deified, thanks in large part to the efforts of his successor, Antoninus Pius. Antoninus' insistence on Hadrian's deification, even at the risk of his own position, speaks to the deep sense of duty and respect he felt towards his adoptive father. The title Pius awarded to Antoninus reflects this sense of piety and duty. Hadrian's mausoleum, now known as Castel Sant'Angelo in Rome, stands as a testament to his legacy. Over the centuries, it has served various purposes, from a fortress to a papal residence, and is now a museum. The structure, with its layers of history, is emblematic of Hadrian's complex legacy, a blend of cultural patronage, architectural innovation, political acumen, and controversial decisions. In the annals of Roman history, Hadrian emerges as a multifaceted figure, an emperor who left an indelible mark on the empire and whose influence can still be seen in the remnants of the structures he commissioned and the policies he implemented. Hadrian's reign marked a significant shift in Roman military strategy. Instead of the aggressive expansionism of his predecessors, Hadrian prioritized the consolidation and defense of the empire's vast territories. His vision of the empire was one of mutual cooperation and shared benefits, emphasizing the idea of empire as a community. This approach was not only pragmatic, considering the empire's vastness and the challenges of maintaining control over distant territories, but also reflected Hadrian's broader philosophical and cultural values. The emperor's decision to withdraw from some of Trajan's conquests, such as Mesopotamia, was not a sign of weakness or jealousy, as some historians have suggested. Instead, it was a strategic move to ensure the empire's long-term stability. 
Hadrian recognized that overextension could lead to vulnerabilities, and he was willing to make difficult decisions to ensure the empire's longevity. Hadrian's focus on fortifying the empire's borders, exemplified by structures like Hadrian's Wall in Britain, was a testament to his defensive strategy. These fortifications, combined with regular military drills and the establishment of permanent military posts, ensured that the Roman legions were always prepared for potential threats. However, Hadrian's reign was not without its critics. Some saw his emphasis on discipline and spit and polish as mere posturing, while others believed he was more interested in the pageantry of war than actual combat. Yet, the relative peace and stability of his reign speak to the effectiveness of his policies. In addressing the challenges of his time, including a shortage of traditional Roman recruits, Hadrian was innovative. He incorporated non-citizen troops, known as numeri, into the Roman military, leveraging their unique skills and expertise. This not only addressed manpower shortages, but also integrated diverse groups into the Roman military machine. In conclusion, Hadrian's military policies were a blend of pragmatism, innovation, and a deep understanding of the complexities of ruling a vast empire. While he may have faced criticism from some quarters, the peace and stability of his reign stand as a testament to his leadership and vision. Hadrian's reign was marked by a deep understanding of the complexities of the vast Roman Empire and a keen sense of governance. One of his most significant contributions was the codification of Roman law. By establishing the perpetual edict, he aimed to bring consistency and clarity to the legal system, ensuring that laws were no longer subject to individual interpretations, but were fixed statutes. This move was not just about legal clarity, it was also a political maneuver to consolidate the power of the emperor and reduce the influence of other magistrates. His reforms in the legal system also highlighted the existing social hierarchies within the Roman Empire. The distinction between the honestiores and humiliores was not just a reflection of economic status, but was deeply embedded in the legal privileges and punishments meted out. While the higher classes enjoyed certain protections and leniencies, the lower classes faced harsher penalties for the same offenses. This codification, while reinforcing the social order, also provided some protections to the vulnerable. Hadrian's stance on slavery, for instance, was a mix of traditional acceptance and progressive reform. While he did not challenge the institution of slavery itself, he introduced measures to protect slaves from extreme cruelty and ensured that free men were not unlawfully detained. Hadrian's policies also reflected his traditionalist values. He enforced dress codes, promoted gender segregation in public spaces, and even regulated the opening hours of public baths. These measures, while seemingly minor, were indicative of his broader vision for the empire, one that balanced tradition with governance needs. In conclusion, Hadrian's legal and social reforms showcased his intricate understanding of the empire's needs. He navigated the delicate balance between maintaining tradition and introducing necessary reforms, ensuring that the empire remained stable and prosperous under his watch. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the life and legacy of Emperor Hadrian. His reign was a tapestry of architectural marvels, cultural advancements, and political challenges, and understanding his impact helps us appreciate the intricacies of Roman history. Thank you for watching this episode of History Uncovered. If you found this video informative and engaging, please like and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating stories from the past. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications so that you never miss a new video. Until next time, keep uncovering the stories that make our history so rich and intriguing.